So today, last lesson, um, yeah, I'm smiling, but I'm sad. Uh, I wanted to talk about energy-based models and how to train them, but I think I need to prepare like for a month before that. So actually, uh, if you are still interested in this summer, you will be able to uh, get a tutorial on energy-based models. Uh, we are writing a paper with Jan together. Uh, and so we actually, I'm planning to get this paper written as like part is going to be math and then part is going to be actually the implementation uh, such that you can actually execute uh, the paper basically and you can get, you know, a, a better understanding of what's going on. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, that's going to come out maybe in a month. Uh, we, we, I have to do pretty a pretty good job there. Um, so, and maybe, uh, if the, maybe we can even have a additional class later on, if you're interested and, you know, I'm always here, uh, up for, uh, teaching you. So again, if you're interested in this energy based model later on, like outside the course and whatever, we can again, meet and, uh, record and, and, and the pretend is actually <laughs> one more class. Okay. So yeah, I, I didn't manage to do it for today. So today we're going to be covering, um, if I get to finish two topics, um, we never talk about them uh, too much before uh, because they are more machine learning related, but nevertheless, we care also in deep learning. And the topic of the day is regularization, overfitting and regularization. Let me start uh, sharing the screen. So again, this is my, uh, as usual, um, perspective of the topic. Uh, it's not usually the mainstream, but you know, it's what you get since it's my view and I'm, I'm your educator, your instructor today. So overfitting and regularization, connection between them, right? So those are two different topics. Those are two different things, but they are of course connected. So I start with this drawing here. Uh, someone told me it's not intuitive, but again, for me it is so. There you get it. Uh, here I'm showing you in the uh, with the pink box the data complexity. Okay, so those dots are sample from my are samples from from my training data set, and then I try to fit their three different models. Okay, so in the first case, that is uh, basically uh, the model complexity is below is under is um, you know, it's smaller than the data complexity. And therefore you have some phenomenon called underfitting, right? Because you try to fit uh, what looks like a parabola with a straight line. And therefore you're, um, not, you're, not going, you're not doing a good job, right? Then what happened next? Here, we actually have the right fitting. In this case, the model complexity matches the data complexity, right? Um, and so in this case, what's the difference with the previous case? Uh, in this case, you have zero error, right? So your, your model exactly matches the training points, those points. Uh, finally, we have overfitting where the model complexity is actually greater than the data complexity. In this case, the model doesn't choose a parabola because why? question for your audience, live, my audi live audience. Why is this um, model like wiggly in this case? Why is not uh, a parabola? And you're supposed to type in the chat because otherwise I don't know if you're following. So my question is in the last case, my data, my model complexity is superior than the, is larger than the data complexity and Although those points look like they belong to a parabola, my model decides to get that spiky guy, like spiky peak on the left and, you know, some weird stuff. Model doesn't learn, but memorizes. Um, overfitting, but sure, sure, it's written there, overfitting, but why, if those points are coming from a parabola, I would expect even a very larger model would make like a very nice parabola, right? Uh, your privately writing to me, don't private, like, private write. Um, so if 
And this is a big if, right? If my points, my training points come from an actual parabola, even the overfitting model would be making a perfect parabola. The point here is that there is some noise, right? There is always some noise. And therefore, the model that perfectly goes through every training point will be like that. It's going to be like crazy because all those points don't exactly live on the parabola, but they are slightly offset. And in order to be perfectly uh, going through them, you're going to have, you know, the model is going to have to try to uh, come up with some funky function. Okay. Does it make sense? So the point is that without noise, this would be just a perfect parabola. So someone would say, oh, okay, maybe we should use the right fitting, right? Um, in machine learning, maybe uh, we are doing deep learning <laughs> and it's not quite the case. Uh, right fitting, it's, it's definitely not the case. Actually, our models are so, 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 so powerful that they even managed to learn noise. Like there, there was a paper there where they were showing that you can uh, label ImageNet with random labels. And you can get a network to, you know, perfectly memorize every label uh, for each of these samples. So you can cl clearly tell that these, uh, the models we are using are absolutely overparametrized, and therefore means that you have way more power than the... Uh, you know, then, then it's necessary in order to learn the structure of the data. Nevertheless, we actually need that. Hmm. So let's figure out what's going on, okay? Um, oh, actually, maybe you know the answer, right? So what is the point? Why do we want to go in very, very high dimensional space? I told you a few times, right? Because, who answers? Come on, it's the last class, answer me. <laughs> Why do we want to go in very, to expand the, the data distribution? Yeah, it, optimization is easier. Yeah, fantastic. That's the point, right? Whenever we go in a high uh, over parametrized space, everything is very easy to move around, right? And therefore, we always would like to put ourselves in the overfitting uh, scenarios with our networks because it's, the training is gonna be easier. Nevertheless, What's the problem now? Well, the problem is they, you're gonna be like, they wiggle, wiggle like crazy. Um, another, another thing, um, so this is point number one. Point number two, why would you think you actually have to overfit when writing your script? Second question. I know, interactive question today. Uh, actually show there is some trend you can model. Mm, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's in the right direction, but it's too complicated as an answer. Um, so are you experts, uh, neural network trainer? You should be, right? Because you've been uh, following these lessons for a bit. But um, at the beginning, okay, try to answer this question. So why would you like to overfit? I even tell you one, one bit more. Uh, I would always, I, I do always start training my network on one batch. E if the model has capabilities. So this is the number one rule to debug machine learning code, okay? You would like to see whether you fucked up in your model creation, okay? So first thing, you can just get a batch of the correct size uh, even with random noise, right? Even, you know, torch.rand something with random labels. And then you would like to go over a few epochs with one batch with random crap, which could be the first batch of your data set or whatever, just to prove that your model can learn, okay? You can easily make some tiny mistakes uh, like I made a few times, like doing the zero, zero grad uh, after the backward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it happens and nothing happens, nothing learns, okay? So you always want to see that your model model can learn, right? Then if it, if you can memorize, yeah, fantastic. We are going to be now learning how to uh, improve performance of a me model that memorizes uh, its own data, okay? So two reasons, right? First one, we said over parameterize. 
uh, models are easy to train because the landscape is much smoother. Uh, and you know, if you have an over-parameterized over model, you're gonna have you can uh, ideally start with different initializations. So you get initial points in the parameter space, and then whenever you train these different models, all of them will converge to a different position uh, because you can think about like a same a same model. You can uh, permute all the weights. You're gonna get, I mean, you permute the weights per layer, you can still get the same uh, model at the end. So they are comparable in terms of the function approximator you are uh, building. Nevertheless, in the parameter space, they are not the same, right? So in the function space, they are exactly equivalent models. In the parameter space, they are absolutely different models. Uh, nevertheless, they will converge to um, equivalently uh, equivalent models, as in they will perform equivalently equivalently good, right? Are you following, right? Am I talking about weird stuff today? But uh, I guess this counts a bit also from Joan's class, where we talk about parameter space and functional uh, functional space. It's so so cool that class. I think next year I will try to put it online as well. Okay, okay. So first point, over-parameterization over helps with training. Second point, over-parameterization over helps you with math debugging. Can you repeat the point about function and parameter space? Yeah. So if you have a, a neural net and you permute the rows in your matrices, right? And then you permute the, uh, the column of the, uh, the next layer, you can basically you know, you can reorganize the weights, so you can get always the same performance, right? So if you have the first matrix, you have first element of the hidden layer equals some number. Let's say the hidden layer has size of two, right? So you have a matrix with two rows. And so you can swap the, the rows, you're gonna get a hidden layer that is flipped. And then the last, the next next weight matrix, you can flip the um, columns, I guess, uh, and you would get exactly the same network, the same, um, you would, uh, sorry, you would get exactly the same function. It's gonna give you exactly the same number as an output. Although the parameters, the, the parameters are actually different, right? Because you swap them. So the same parameter W11 uh, is gonna be W21, right? So they, they are different. So in the parameter space, these are different models. So there are one point is here in the parameter space, one other point is here. Nevertheless, the mapping from the parameter space to the functional space, both of them, both these two initial, those two configuration will map to the same function, right? Because the function connects the input to the output and they are gonna be the same, even if you do this permutation of the rows and then in the, of the columns, right? Make sense? So it's, if we, if the space of parameters if the space for parameter space is very big for a given data set, can we say that the model is very uncertain about its prediction? Okay, we are gonna be talking about uncertainty in a bit. So I'll address that in a bit. All right, so we always start with the third uh, column here with overfitting. Uh, I always want to have a model that is over parameterized because it's easy to learn. And also it's gonna be powerful in terms, uh, in, in the sense that it's gonna be learning more than what we expect. Um, and so how do we deal with this overfitting? How do we uh, improve now the validation or testing performances, right? So we, we said that overfitting means, uh, we didn't say, we're gonna see that next slide, but here we see how to fight this kind of you know, overfitting. So we start from the right-hand side where we introduce this weak regularizer. So there is no regularization. Therefore, the last plot the sixth plot here is the same as my third plot, okay? Then I keep uh, adding some medium regularizer. And so I, I, I like to think about this as, you know, smoothing edges, right? So my square gets you know, around edges. And you can tell now that this second plot here is different from my second window here, right? So the, the medium regularization is different from the just right fitting. As you can see, there are some you know, corners here. Finally, if you crank up this medicine, this kind of, you know, it's like a drug you, you're drugging, you're hitting, you're poisoning your model, 
for to restrict the, its 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 power, then you get like a very strong regularizer, which gives you the the, the circular one. This is this is my mental image. Anyhow, we we gave you. I think I give you my uh, the big picture first, and then let's go on with the actual definitions, right? Um, so there are a few definitions here. They are not quite equivalent, but in deep learning, that's what we use. So here we go. So the regularization adds prior knowledge to a model. A prior distribution is specified for the parameters. So we expect these parameters to be coming from a specific distribution, from a specific generation, generating process, okay? Uh, and then whenever we actually think about regularization, we can think about, you know, uh, strongly assuming that these parameters should be um, coming from this specific process that generates them. Okay, so this is talking about parameter space. Then we can also talk about the functional space. In this case, we can be, it can be seen, a regularization is a restriction of the set of possible learnable functions okay so these are again two perspective one is on the weights where how are supposed to be what kind of weights what, what kind of animals what kind of objects these weights are like they should be somehow of a, some specific shape uh length or whatever structure there is there is some structure that i assume uh in advance that's the prior this means before in latin and in others in the other case instead if you have all possible function you'd like to find a restriction of those possible functions such that they uh, are not too uh, crazy, okay? They are not too extreme as in the way they behave. Uh, there's a question, but in that image, the square is still in the circle. Uh, yeah, I'm getting back. Oh, oh, I see. So maybe the circle should have been smaller than the square. Okay, <laughs> right, good point. Um, okay, cool, cool. Finally, that's the last definition of regularization, which is the real, real deep learning part, which is the following, which is yeah, kind of, not it's like, you know, as a, as, a, as a stretch. Okay, my Google thinks I'm talking Italian. What the heck? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Regularization is any modification we make to a learning algorithm that is intended to reduce its generalization error, but not its training error. Okay, so this is actually a stretch because it's no longer talking about prior knowledge and functional space, but actually modification to learning algorithms. So this is like moving towards maybe programming, you know, uh, so uh, parameters, function, then it's like algorithmic implementation. Right? So these are really three different perspectives of the same thing. Cool. So first, let's start with regularizing regularizing techniques, a few examples. So first, actually, I, I start with Xavier initialization. I told you before that we can think about these parameters as coming from some generation, generating process, right? So whenever you initialize a network, you can choose to you can choose to select one uh, uh, regular um, one prior, right? So these are this is defining where your um, your your weights are coming from. So in this case, we can choose Xavier normal, which is a initialization technique, and this assumes this kind of Gaussian um, Gaussian distribution, right? So you have the weight space, weight values, and you know the most of them will be picked towards the zero, and then you have some kind of um, some 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 kind of uh, standard deviation that is based on the size of the input and output uh, size of that specific layer, and so from here we can start introducing the weight decay. Weight decay is the first regularization technique that is widespread in machine learning. Not maybe not maybe too much in uh, neural nets, still relevant. So weight decay uh, you can find it in uh, directly inside the uh, Optim package. Like you, it's a flag in the in the different in the different optimizer, is also called L2 regularization, ridge regression, or Gaussian prior, which basically tells you that things come from this Gaussian process or Gaussian you know distribution generating distribution. Nevertheless, we call it weight decay. 
So why do we call it weight decay? Uh, so this is first thing that, you know, if you train neural net, you're going to call weight decay, not the other things. So we can start with this J train. That's our objective, which is acting upon the parameters, uh, which is equal the old training, the, 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 the one without the regularization, plus a penalty term, like, um, like the, the following. So we have the, the square norm, the square two norm, right, of these parameters. And so if you uh, make, the, if you compute the, the, the gradient, of course, you're gonna get just the uh, lambda theta, right? Because the two comes down, simplifies, you get that guy. So if you think about this um, second equation, what do you see? You say that the theta gets previous theta minus, you know, the, the minus a step. So like minus a step towards uh, the gradient. So a step towards the opposite direction of the gradient such that you can go down the hill, right? In your training loss. Minus some eta lambda, which is a, uh, a scalar multiplying by um, theta, right? And that means that there's going to be, you know, the first part tells you, oh, go down the hill, whereas the other one tells you, eh, go also towards where? Zero, right? And so how does, this, how does this look? So this looks like this, right? In every point, so consider we are already trained and the training loss is zero, and we just consider the second term, right? So let's consider we already finished training. So uh, there is no, there is not this term. We just have theta minus eta lambda theta. What does it mean? So if there is no uh, at the first term here, in any point you are, so in theta, you're gonna be subtracting some multiplier, some scalar. You know, I told you scalar, a scalar is what scales, right? So this scalar scales this vector, uh, probably by a factor that is lower than one. And so if you're here, this one is gonna take you down on the point that is connecting your head of the theta towards zero, right? Or this point here, this is theta, and then it takes you down to zero, okay? So if you don't have this term here and you perform a few steps in uh, this, uh, you know, in this parameter update, you're gonna get that the vector field that you know results is something that attracts you towards zero, and that's why it's called weight decay, right? So if you let it go, this stuff, it's gonna decay to zero. Hmm? Makes sense, right? So these are very cute drawings, I think. Cool. So okay, now you know about weight decay. A weight decay is also, um, we can think about this as adding a constraint over the length of a vector. So the length of a vector is the, you know, the, 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 the Euclidean norm. And so here we basically try to reduce the length of this vector, right? So weight decay is a way to reduce the length. Okay, so L1, hmm. What is this L1? So L1 can also be uh, used as a flag in the optimizer in Torch. Uh, it's also called lasso, which is least absolute shrinking selector operator. Wow. <laughs> yeah, statisticians, whatever. Um, it's also called a Laplacian prior because it comes from a Laplacian uh, probability distribution. Uh, and then also, it can be uh, called as a sparsity prior. Why is that? So this is, this is pretty interesting. So here in the bottom part, you can see there is the dashed line uh, represent my Gaussian prior, right? And then here I just show you the Laplace. What's the difference with Laplace? Laplace is the same as Gaussian. So you have the exponential, uh, but instead of having the quadrat square norm, you have the uh, one norm, okay? And so the, the whereas the, the, the the, you know, whereas the quadratic is very shallow, like it's very flat towards zero, the, the L1 is like a, it's a spiky, right? So that's why if you get the exponential, you get, a, you get a spike. This is minus the, the, the absolute value, right? So you get a spike for the Laplacian or you get like a smooth for the square because you have the parabola, right? Which is smooth on the bottom part. 
Okay, so um, the point is that there is much more mass now in this region than it was before, right? So this is pretty, this is like a spike. There is much more probability that you get something towards zero. Nevertheless, maybe this is not too clear as an explanation. So I show you the second diagram. So in this case, my training loss, instead of being the old train loss, I'm gonna be summing lambda, the norm one of my theta, okay? Therefore, if you compute the gradient of the L1, what do you get? So L1 is going to be just one, right? If you're positive, or it's gonna be minus one in the sine function, yeah, exactly. So you get eta, eta lambda sine function. And so let's now think the same way what happens uh, if you already finished training and you don't have this term over here and you just get theta minus eta lambda sine theta. So if you are on the, on the x-axis, you know, the, the y is completely doesn't have, is, is already zero. So you're going to get some arrows bringing you in, right? So if you're on the axis, you're going to get exactly as L2. You're going to go towards zero. Now, what happens if you're in first quadrant? So in the first quadrant, you get a sign in both direction, right? Scale by the scalar factor there. And so it's going to be pointing down this way. So here I show you the, uh, the, the gray arrows here. They're showing you the L2 regularization, which are taking you from the initial point towards zero as proportional to this vector that is here. Whereas the L1, which is going to be in a different color and color green, the L1 instead, starting from here, it takes you down 40 degrees here. And then what happened here? Well, you just kill the Y component, right? And so the L1 uh, vector field, it will quickly kill components that are close to the axis, right? So if you're kind of close to the axis, this one, bam, takes you down to the axis in a view, in a few steps, right? And then if you still apply this one, you're gonna go down the axis here, right? So. This one allow you to quickly go down here. And then if you still apply, you can shrink the length. But the point is that you're not looking at the uh, length shrinking as in the, uh, in, in the L2, right? So L2 was just shrinking the length of the vector. In the L1 instead, you actually gonna kill the components that are kind of clean, uh, near the axis, okay? So I, I think you can clearly now understand how this works, right? So, uh, and this actually is quite relevant for training, uh, let's say, you know, our regularized, um, uh, regularized latent variable models, because you can, you know, you can think about, you know, a very quick way to regularize this, uh, this latent variables are gonna be just killing some of these components such that only the information is gonna be restricted in a few of these uh, values, okay? You like this stuff? You like the drawings? Hmm? They're cute, I think. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, dropout, right? So we, we talk, I think, about dropout a few times, but I never show you the animation. So, uh, arrow, boom, okay. So dropout, what does this dropout do? So I can show you my ninja skills in PowerPoint and we have an infinite loop animation. So the input in the pink is provided to the network. Uh, and then you have that these hidden layers, hidden neurons are sometimes set to zero. In this case is you have a dropping rate of 0.5. So half of the neurons are gonna be turned to zero on, uh, randomly during the training. And so what happens here is that there is no more path between the input and the output that is, uh, you know, it, it, there is no learning of a singular path for input to output. So every time, if you want to try to memorize one specific input, you can't because every time you get a different network. And so again, this basically tell you, uh, uh -oh. 
this card. Okay. So what happens here is that again, before, if we have like a fully connected network like this, you can think about, oh, I would like to memorize this neuron uh, going this path and then here, right? So you can try to memorize uh, some specific, you know, sample you get, you can memorize a specific sample in this case. But again, if you have the network that is taking off neurons sometimes, sometimes this neuron here on the left-hand side doesn't exist, right? And so if this one doesn't exist, then you cannot memorize a specific path. Moreover, you can think about this dropout as training a infinitely infinite number of networks that are different, right? Because every time you, you, you drop some neurons, you basically get a new network. Uh, they all share the initial kind of starting position with the initial weights. But then at the end, whenever you use it at inference, usually you turn off this dropout uh, and then you have to scale the, the, the weights, right? Because otherwise you get a network that is, you know, uh, blowing you up this is because if you have half of the neurons off you know the other neurons are doing the half of the neurons are doing the whole job and if you turn everyone on you're going to have twice as many more uh values so, so you can do two things uh, or when you actually use dropout you crank up you multiply by by let's say one over uh, the dropping rate so if you have dropping rate of 0.5 you can multiply by two, such that uh, your neurons are twice as powerful, right? Twice as more powerful uh, than one minus 0.5, right? One divided one minus 0.5. So if you have a dropping rate of 0 0.1, uh, means you have 90% of your neurons there. And so your neurons should be one over 0 0.9 stronger, right? Um, to, to be to have like the same kind of power, right? In terms of uh, values. Uh, anyhow, so you can think about uh, drop dropout as having these multiple networks during training, but then whenever you use them at inference, you turn off this dropout module and you basically average out all these performance of the singular network. Mm -hmm. And these allow you to get, you know, a much better reduction of the noise, uh, mm -hmm which was introduced, like that was arised by the, the, the training uh, procedure. Because again, if you have, you know, multiple experts, you take the average of multiple experts, you're going to get a better um, answer because it's going to be removing that kind of variability in, in the specific answer. Right? But perhaps we should keep in mind this variability of the answers, okay? Because it can turn out quite interesting. Anyhow, so... Dropout is an amazing way to basically have an automatic uh, model averaging, uh, model ensembling uh, performance. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, is dropout a good technique only for classification tasks or also for other tasks as well, like metric learning, encoding learning? I, I would say that dropout gives you a much more robust uh, uh, network, a much more robust prediction regardless of the task it doesn't it doesn't restrict to classification you basically train uh, multiple networks of reduced size right and then you average out this reduced size network so although at the end you're going to have a large network this large network is just the uh, average of small networks uh, performance so and also if you think in this way the small network can no longer overfit right because they are no longer that overparametrized, perhaps, right? And so dropout allow you, allows you to fight overfitting with several, uh, by different, you know, mechanisms. Finally, you can think, uh, if you apply, let's think about like uh, applying dropout to the input. This is kind of uh, sort of like uh, denoising out encoder, no? I mean, you perturb the input, right? Mm -hmm. In, in this case, and then you force still the output to be the same. So if you think about that, you are going to be insensitive to some small variations of the input, uh, which are gonna make your network more robust, right? Or the same as I was, uh, as I wrote you in the midterm, 
uh, how can you get a input that is you know annoying you can find some noise in the input which is going to be uh, increasing your uh, your loss right so you can do some kind of adversarial generation of noise and then you try to you train your network on these um, handcrafted samples which were um, corrected were like perturbed in order to uh, increase your your training loss right okay so i give you like four different reasons why to use dropout but then i don't use dropout <laughs> some not that often i actually do use it for a different reason which i'm going to be coming to that in a bit um okay so early stopping so this is much one of the most basic techniques uh if you're training your model and your validation loss starts uh, starts increasing then you stop there okay uh such that you get the lowest validation score and um, which tells you okay you're not yet overfitting uh, and that basically doesn't let your weights grow too much, right? So instead of getting the L2, which is trying not to get those weights to get too lengthy, too long, too long, you just stop whenever they are not yet that long, right? Uh, fighting overfitting. So these are techniques that end up regularizing our parameters, our models, but but they are not they are not regularizers, okay? So this is important. These are not regularizer, although they do regularize the uh, network. Hmm? Okay, as long as you keep this in mind, we can also uh, see these uh, other options, but they are not regularizing techniques, right? They do act as a regularizer though. First one, batch normalization. Okay, so we talk about this several times. Uh, we don't know quite how it works too well. There is a, an article uh, on a blog post that is explaining this. I, we put the link in the optimization uh, lecture. Check it out. I think it's like lecture seven of some blog post. I really can't remember. Anyhow, so the point is that you reset the, the mu, the, the mean and the sigma, the, the sigma square, the variance at each layer. And these allow you to, okay, the, when you reset the mean and the sigma, this is based on the specific batch you have, right? Because you compute the mean and the sigma square over the specific batch. But then if you actually sample uniformly from your training data set, you will never have two ident identical batches, right? So every batch will have a different configuration of samples. Therefore, if you compute the mean and the standard deviation, they will always be different, right? And therefore, again, I said five times, therefore, you're going to be applying a different correction per batch. And the model will never see twice the same input, right? Because they are altered based on where they happen to uh, appear in your training uh, procedure. So because you'd never show the same uh, same input twice. And this is so cool. Uh, I really like it. And that's all you need usually most of the time to train your network. You don't want to need um, dropout. And this technique also speeds up your training like crazy. Before batch norm was introduced, it was taking me, I think, one week to train uh, on ImageNet. I think at least... If it, was, if it wasn't a month, it was terrible, I think. But again, that's like eight years ago. Uh, yeah, it was terrible training on ImageNet. Uh, with batch normalization, I think you can train in one day. So that's ridiculous. Do you mean robust in terms of adversarial learning as well? I don't understand why we don't see the same sample twice. Um, I'm saying robust here as in... Uh, you're providing different inputs every time because, and so the network gets a better coverage of what is the training manifold. Uh, you don't see the same tw uh, input twice because the same input based on how it appears in the, in the batch. So if it appears, you have, you know, input 42 and this input 42 happens in a given batch you subtract the mean of that batch and divide by the standard deviation and you get the, the new you know, value right, within the network. But then if that input 42 happens in a different batch, then the mean of the different batch is going to be a different mean. 
And therefore, you're going to get a slightly different input every time. So you never actually observe the same input because they happen to be packed in a different batch. And therefore, the statistics of that specific batch will be just specific to that batch. And, you know, it's going to change every time you're going to have a different batch. So same input, get a different um, correction, let's say this way, uh, if it appears in a different batch. So it you never see the same input twice. So this technique is all I use usually for training my network. Um, and it works. But again, recently I've been using Dropout for a different reason. So we are going to be... Um, Okay, we are going to see this in a, in a few minutes. Uh, more data, <laughs> of course. Just provide more data, you're going to fight all overfitting, but then, you know, ting, 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 ting. Okay, uh, finally, data augmentation. So data augmentation is also a very valid technique in order to, you know, prove, provide some kind of uh, deformed version of the input. If you're talking about images, we have... Uh, center crop, color jitter, different crops, uh, transformations, like a fine tra random transformations, crops, random rotation, horizontal flip, right? If you see myself like that and you flip my face, I'm still me, kind of, right? So uh, if it's upside down, well, maybe not quite. Uh, nevertheless, you can see that if you provide some alterations that are perturbation that you are if you'd like to be insensitive against, then you can improve your perf uh, performance of the network, which is going to be learning how to be insensitive to this kind of, uh, you know, variations. Okay, okay, okay. So quickly, quickly, quickly. Oh, okay, transfer learning. Uh, we already know about uh, transfer learning, I think. But again, so you get your network, you already train on a specific task, you just leave the first classifier there, you move everything. You plug a new uh, a new classifier or whatever, and then if you have you know a few data with a similar kind of training distribution, you just do transfer learning, which is again uh, training just the final classifier. Uh, if you have lots of data, uh, you should fine tune because you would like to also improve this uh, the performance of the. Like you would like also to tweak the uh, feature extractor, the, the blue the blue layers. Uh, the colors are flipped here. Damn, the hidden layer should have been green and the output blue. Ah. <laughs> okay, few data and different from training. You want to do early uh, transfer learning, which means, you know, you start changing um, also, you know, a little bit of the, the of the other layers as well, not all of them. And then, yeah, you want to remove a few more layers, actually. Yeah, oh, my, my bad. So you would like to remove a few of those uh, final hidden layers because they are kind of already specialized. So you want to retrain the base features extractor here. And if you have lots of data which are different from the training the distribution, just train, okay? Um, okay. Also, you can use different learnings, uh, learning rate for different layers, right? To improve performance. So maybe you, um, you'd like to change, um, yeah. So you, you, can, you can see that usually these final layers are the ones that are changing uh, quicker because they are close to the, uh, to the loss. But then again, if you use a batch norm, all these layers are kind of training the same speed. Otherwise, again, you can, see whether you want to change learning rate, maybe change these guys slower or not. Did you say is the difference between transfer learning and fine tuning? Uh, transfer learning, I just trained the final classifier because I don't have, if you have few data, you don't have enough, you know, you don't want to overfit. So you, if you have few data, you want to just reuse the whole network from the previous task and you just train the final classifier. If you have lots of data, then you can actually even um, try to have like some changes. You can also, you know, you can start, you have a, a lower learning rate. You also change for this feature extractor. If they are so, similarly. So transfer learning, you freeze the, the base network? Yeah, I would say that transfer learning, you just freeze the, the, the blue guy and you just train the, the orange. In a fine tuning, you actually, tune all the other parameters as well, maybe with smaller learning rate. 
This is the uh, number 12 notebook. Here I'm classifying the sentiment of these reviews on the IMDB dataset. All right, and so I'd like to compare different regularization techniques. So I'm just keeping everything because I just like to show you the final result. Let me see, where is the optimizer? So you can toggle different things. Uh, at the beginning, we have no weight decay, nothing, right? So we train with this regularizer. Let's check what is the model. So the model is just a feedforward neural net, uh, which is feedforward neural net. We have some embeddings, a linear, a linear. And then my forward is going to be getting my embeddings, sending to the forward, the fully connected ReLU. Uh, and then, you know, you get the output from the so second fully connected and I'm outputting a sigmoid because I'm just doing, um, I think, a two-class classification problem. So we'd like to figure out if it's a positive review or a negative review. Um, and so this is the initial training. And we got, you know, the validation curve climbs up as crazy, whereas the training curve goes down to zero. And so here you can see uh, the validation accuracy, which goes up to 64, more or less. So, and here we just store uh, the weights of the network for when there is no kind of regularization, okay? Then first thing I'd like to do is gonna be trying to do the uh, weight L1, the L1 regularization. So let's see how to do that. So L1 regularization, okay, toggle this one to do L1 regularization. So here I'm extracting the model parameters and then I'm gonna be adding some term to the, to the loss, okay? So the loss is gonna be some part of this, uh, like I'm gonna sum the, the one norm of the FC1 to the loss, okay? Uh, because there is no other way to do this in a PyTorch for the moment. Okay, so let me reinitialize the network. So I start here. Uh, I get this one and then I start training here. So this guy is training. Uh, how many iterations? Let's check. 10 epochs, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so before we were checking, we can go down here. We had the validation accuracy was around 64. And now we have validation accuracy went to 66, right? So we actually have improved the performance by getting these guys uh, to be, oh, it's getting down. Damn. Oh, back up. <laughs> 67, looks good, 68. Okay, it's finished. So I can show you in this case what happened with L1. Oh, it's not yet finished. Okay, it's taking forever. Okay, while this is training, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna show you the, the output of this guy and then I'm gonna be showing just briefly the uh, second usage of the dropout. Shall we stop this guy, 69? So you can see now we are at 69 in validation accuracy, right? Okay, cool. And here you can see both the training and the validation. They are both losses, they go down. And then here I show you the validation, which went up to 67 and 68, okay? And so here I just show, I'm gonna be storing these weights for the L1. So here I just store this L1 over here, okay? I'm gonna go back. Here, uh, we are gonna be undoing this one, right? Because we don't want uh, L1. We're gonna be choosing now a L2 regularizer, right? So I can toggle this one and toggle this one. All right, so now we have a weight decay of this value. Um, model, I execute this one and I execute these guys. All right, so while the L2 is training, I'll just show you a quick uh, overview about Bayesian neural nets. So estimating a predictive distribution. So why to care about uncertainty? Many reasons. Uh, if you have a cat dog classifier and you show a hippopotamus, the network is gonna tell you, oh, this is a dog, 
No, it doesn't know. It cannot tell you, oh, this is not of any of the above, right? You can think about, oh, let's make a third category. But then how can you show you, how can you show the network, not a cat and not a dog? Uh, it doesn't quite work like that. So you can't really find, I mean, cat is an object. Dog is a object not a cat or not a dog is not an object so you can't really train your network to say everything else um reliability on steering control let's say you're training your car to steer right and left and then your car say steer to the right okay hold on how certain are you <laughs> about this action is it is it gonna kill me right uh, physics simulator prediction. If you know about uh, physics or physicists, they always want to know how certain you are about your value, right? So measurements uh, in physics always have, you know, you have the value plus minus the uncertainty. And so, you know, your network should be able to tell you as well how certain uh, some number are, what is the, uh, in the confidence interval for a specific prediction. Moreover, you can think to use this for minimizing action randomness when connected to a reward. What the heck does this mean? So if there is some uncertainty with some associated some, to some actions, you can actually exploit that and train your model to minimize that uncertainty. And this is so cool because we use something similar in, my, in our project, right? So dropout, I told you about before. Uh, so how this neural net with dropout works, I'm just gonna be quickly going through this. I multiply my input and my hidden layer with these uh, random uh, zero one masks, okay? And you can have the activation function to be some non-linearity. And then here you have this Bernoulli with the probability of one minus the dropping out rate. So this is the dropping out rate, and then you want to scale the uh, delta such that you know you resize the amplitude of those weights. The training has just finished, so I'm gonna be switching that. I'm sorry for the context switching. Oh, okay, cool, cool. All right, uh, calculate the variance. Yes, someone was saying calculate the variance. I know I'm switching. I'm I'm sorry. It's the last lesson. I'm making a mess. Okay, so this was train, and we got 64. Uh, which is, so these are also going both down. This is both the, the L2 regularization. And before we were getting to 68 with the L1, here we get something else. Maybe, we, oh, you can see it's still climbing, right? So maybe I just stopped too early. So if you keep training, you're gonna get a better performance. It, it's, it's monotonic, uh, non-decreasing, right? So I think kind of, so I think you, you can squeeze more. And here I'm going to be saving these weights in these L2 weights. Okay, so I save that. And the last one, then I sh then it's going to be the, exactly the dropout, right? So go back here. Uh, we turn off the L2. So we turn off this guy. We turn back the simple one. But then we have to go back in this network. We would like to turn on the dropout rate. True, there you go, boom, boom, boom. Okay, is it training? Yeah, it's training. All right, cool, 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 cool. Back to the presentation. <laughs> I, I know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going over time. What a bad teacher. <laughs> okay, so this is actually what we are doing, the dropout part, right? Okay, cool, cool. All right. So this is my dropout. I, I mean, I mean, I am basically multiplying these inputs and hidden layers with masks. Here you just have like a network, which has trying is trying to train that you know a prediction uh, that is weekly prediction. It's like a CO two concentration level. Uh, if you use a Gaussian kernel with a square uh, exponential kernel, you can get you know after the dashed line. The network say that the, you know the the model says I have no clue. So I give you my prediction, which is zero. But then this is my confidence level. Can we do something similar with neural nets? Yes, we can. So this is a uh, uncertainty estimation using the ReLU nonlinearity in the network, and this is instead the using tan h, which is exactly nothing. Um, if I'd like to do a binary classification 
In the first case, are going to be my logits uh, on the section minus three to 2.5 is the training training the training uh, interval. And then, if I show you, if I show my network, uh, if I ask, oh, what is the prediction for x hat, no x star? If I don't use any uncertainty estimation, you're going to get a very high value, right? Which is correspondent to, oh, this is uh, one. So this is my one class. If I just use the, the, yellow, the white, big, thick line. Instead, if you use this uncertainty estimation, you get this network to get those logits here with it kind of, you know, uh, blur, foggy shadow. And therefore, if you apply the sigmoid, you get basically that to flip down from zero to one, right? So you no longer say it's one. You can say it's one with some specific probability, right? Um, and here I'm showing you a, a network that is trying to, it was trained on MNIST, and then you provide a one that is, you know, tilting. And then you can see that it begins with having a high value for the logits for the purple, for the, for the one. And then as you move across, it becomes like a five and then becomes a seven because it looks like some part of the one, like some part of the, the seven, right? And these are the output after the uh, soft argmax. So you see that, uh, you know, after you tilt, they get very blur and very spread around. So how can we have something like that? And this is the other notebook. So um, we are done here with the regularization. Let me give you the final thing. So here we can see with the dropout, you always have the validation and train curves. They are one on the other. And then this was the L2 regularization. I can execute this other one, which shows you also that this is keep increasing, right? So although the model is over parameterized, we are not overfitting, which was the case uh, at the beginning. Finally here, let's store these weights in the dropout version, okay? So I save all of them. Uh, and so I can start showing you a few things. Um, for example, this one, let's see if it works. Boom. So here you can see that the red are the L1 and the red one are basically all in the center. Bam. And all the other reds are to zero, right? So L1, I just show you the histogram of the weights. When I train the network with the L1 regularizer, you get all of these are here. In the purple case, you actually have, it looks like it's higher. I'm not entirely sure why you have a higher peak at zero in L2. Uh, but then the purple one have some values as well here in the tails. Whereas if there is no regularization, you get something that is, you know, resembling a much spread, um, a much spread um, Gaussian, right? So you get values that are much, much more, much larger, okay? Uh, instead, the L1 should be all towards, you know, very, very short. Again, I'm not sure why this purple is taller than the, the red here. I think it's an issue. So this, I, I show you the, the, the weights. Uh, we can show like, the individual one, so the L1. So L1, basically all are here. And this is, these are instead the one with nothing, right? So these are the one without the regularization. And these are the one with, the L1 regularization. We can also have more bins to have a better, a better understanding of what's going on. Okay, see? Boom, fantastic, right? Uh, and I can show you also the weights L2. L2. L2 and L1. Oh, you can tell, no? What's the difference? But again, there are 100,000, 100,000. Uh, not entirely sure, but in the point, the point is that in the L1, in the L1, you have so many more weights, uh, cluster uh, at the zero, but there are a few larger weights. In the L2, you have all the weights are pretty small. Can you see, right? There is no large weights. So L1 doesn't shrink the weight. L1 just get them towards zero. Okay, that's why you had this big guy here. Boom. Okay. Uh, finally, I know I'm over time. The last notebook. 
which is the one that is computing the uncertainty uh, through usage, usage of the uh, dropout, right? So kernel execute all. Uh, where is it? Run all. So what are we doing here? How do we compute the uncertainty in the previous uh, in the in the in the previous uh, in the previous lesson, right? In the slides I just show you. So here we have some points. I try to fit them with my network, and you get something like this. Can you tell me what network I used? What is the uh, where is the chat? Can you tell what is the um, nonlinearity I used? You should know, right? You don't answer. Answer. <laughs> okay. Um, and so here, yeah, Rilu. And then here I show you how this uncertainty looks. Okay, so what is this? This I'm using the uh, the network with a dropout, and then I actually don't use the evaluation mode. I just use the training mode such that the dropout is still on. And then I compute the variance of the predictions of the network by sending multiple times the data through, okay? So here you have range in 100, you know, I just provide 100 times my data inside the network. Okay, so this is a network with a ReLU. Let me show you how a network with a uh, hyperbolic tangent uh, works. So, oh, oh, yeah, let me kill this one. So here I create the network. Um, and this is the network trained with the hyperbolic tangent, such it's much nicer, right? And then I show you the network is in train mode, right? But then I, I feed several times, I feed 100 times my data points inside, and then I evaluate the mean. And you can see now that the network mean the, the network outputs a uncertainty, which is constant, even if you move outside this uh, interval, which was the region where the training data were coming. So you can see now that these uncertainty estimation are a bit, you know, funky, as in different activation functions give you different kind of estimation. They are not even calibrated. Nevertheless, you have the uncertainty close to the data points. It's very, very, very tiny, right? So you can tell how far you are from the training region. And we use this this trick here, this this um, this part in order to, so again, this variance here is like, it's a, it's a differentiable function. And so you can run gradient descent, right? In this, in order to minimize the variance. And this would allow you to move towards the region where the, uh, where the uh, data points, where basically the, the, the training region. This, this is what we use for the, our policy, right, in our uh, driving scenario. So whew, that was it, right? Uh, we, we reached the end of the class, the end of the semester. Uh, it was such a great honor to be your teacher for this semester. I screw up a little bit, maybe halfway through. <laughs> Thank you for, you know, helping me getting back uh, on my feet. Uh, if you need anything, right, really anything, just let me know. I, I'm always open to discuss and help out and explain. And again, as, you, as I told you before, we can even think to have one more extra lesson in a month's time if you want. Uh, the same way, Zoom and whatever, uh, we, about the energy-based models. Um, again, if you have any question about all any of the lessons, you can write on YouTube in the comments below. Uh, I will answer. If you have like specific, uh, if you're interested in making drawings, a visualization, uh, you can always actually should talk to me because I'm actually uh, creating a group for visualizing machine learning stuff. Um, and we have the website, we have plenty of things to do. English has to be fixed in many of the, uh, in many of the of the of the contributions, some math is broken, and you know there is plenty of things, uh, open source things to do. If you are uh, inclined, if you are interested, and um, and yeah, I think pretty much that's it. Um, I, I'll see you next Monday, right? Again, you should submit the three video presentation. I, I made a um, 
I made a tutorial about how to make a presentation. If you like how I teach and you may want to hear my opinion about how you should present your work, uh, it's on, again, on YouTube. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. All right. So again, thank you so much. And I can't wait to see uh, all your results for the, for, for the project. Um, see you on Monday. Good luck. Bye-bye. Questions about the class? <laughs> ah, fuck. There was one more notebook. Ah, <laughs> damn. Okay. Ah. Okay, uh, let me... Ah, okay. I, I can't go over. I'm too late, right? In the extra, and there is one more notebook I wanted to talk about, which is the... So this is the projection notebook. Ah, damn. Okay. So... Ah, okay, maybe we can do an extra lesson with the projection uh, and I talk about this next week up to you guys. More questions? I know I, it's it's late and uh, there was this notebook. It's okay. Yeah, you know, I want to be teaching more. <laughs> okay. No, no questions. There is a question. Google users visor to select hyperparameters for its neural for its networks those tend to be either random search or gaussian process for hyperparameter optimization yeah, exactly uh yeah but i i haven't worked like i haven't tried them out so i can't really give you a, a opinion so i i know they exist but i'm not <laughs> I, I don't exactly know everything yet <laughs> okay uh i think that's it, right? Okay, so see you Monday. Oh, oh, oh. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Boy, post a lasagna. Oh, I put the I put the lemon cake. Right, keep the teaching going. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I think we are there. Jan is teaching also in the in the fall. Actually, Jan and Kyung Jung are pairing up, and they are teaching in the fall. And I will be also teaching the labs, but I don't know. We haven't yet discussed the content. I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> more teaching. Well, it's fun, but <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay. So I think that was it for today. Unless there are some questions for me, for Jan. Uh, I know you send me emails. I, I have a few I think a few hundred emails from you, I will answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will answer, don't worry. Uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't worry too much. We can figure out what's happened, right? Don't, don't freak out. Uh, as I told you before, we can have an extra lesson in one month uh, for the energy-based models uh, whenever I'm done preparing it. Uh, again, this is like up to you, voluntary. It's, not, it's completely off class, right? It's like... Uh, I, I was thinking that it makes sense since someone asked to create like a lab for the energy-based model and I said yes. Well, I, I, I always keep my word, so uh, I didn't manage to do it on time, but, you know, I will do, I will work for this. Um, questions? Nope. All right, so it was, has been an honor, uh, seriously. I, I, I loved being... Uh, been teaching uh, to you this semester. Uh, you had so many questions and especially when we switched to this online uh, format, I think I, I personally loved it, right? So I, I, at least in my opinion, before we had Jan lecturing and maybe you are a bit shy. Uh, I'm not shy. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't care. So I, I think this format where you write questions and I just read out whatever uh, it's in your mind, uh, it really worked well in terms of you know, figuring out what are those aspects that are least, a, a little bit uh, harder to, uh, to, 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 to catch, right? Uh, because again, we, we may not be able to figure out what is the part that is less, um, less clear, maybe, because we've been talking about these things for a while now. And so again, I think if you write those questions, I read them and we have like a speaker, we have like some kind of conversation presentation it's much more effective in terms of uh, content delivery right yeah i so, want to echo what alfredo said it was a uh, it was a pleasure teaching the class as well you know despite the circumstances and uh um 
you know, I'm very thankful to Alfredo. I think, uh, you know, he's putting his heart into this, as you can tell. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really thankful for, for him to do all this job. Um, um, because I think it, uh, it makes a huge difference in terms of the, uh, usefulness of the class. And, um, so thank you, Alfredo. <laughs> thank you. And Jatsin, right? Jatsin made the, the whole, the chart. And... Actually, did a huge <laughs> amount of work. Oh my God. This last month, Jatsin. To make this competition possible to put together the data, the basic code, the data loader. Uh, this was, I mean, he worked on this for, you know, a lot for the last few months and, and then, you know, gathering, gathering all the, all the results. So thank you, Jatsin. Yeah, I think it's been two months now he's been working <laughs> on this stuff. <laughs> all right, guys, thank you. Uh, you always get me, uh, you know, just tweet me. I answer every time. Uh, uh, anything you need, you know, you can find me. My door is always open uh, or in the office or here on, on Zoom, right? So, um, just, you know, as Alfredo said, this, this project, uh, we have this uh, autonomous driving project and, uh, you know, uh, we need all the help we can get with this. So if you are in some of the top teams and you're interested in participating, uh, get in touch with Alfredo and, you know, you could work on this during the summer or 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 perhaps beyond. All right. All right. Um, Bye-bye, guys. To all the teams. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.